Juste Cool, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Nous vous recevons pour une chaîne internet qui s'appelle Thinkerview. Nous sommes en direct. Est-ce que vous pouvez vous présenter succinctement Je suis un American writer, the author of the best-seller La Flotte Fantôme en France, Ghost Fleet, United States, which explored the war that the U.S. may have with China in the 2020s. More recently, uh, as of today, I have a new book called Control, which is going to be coming, it's out in France, about the coming collision with artificial intelligence and robotics. I'm obsessed with trying to figure out what's next, what are the problems that society is rushing towards that it may be missing. These big ideas, these big conflicts are something that just are, are very much what I wake up every day trying to, trying to think more about, and of course, use fiction to understand them better. Comment s'appelle votre co-auteur et qui est-il I am lucky enough to work with an American writer named Peter Singer. His pen name is P.W. Singer. And we've had a partnership that is, at this point, about eight years old. And in my old life, I used to be a journalist in Washington, D.C. At, at, at the Wall Street Journal. And he was a source of mine when I was writing about private military companies, defense matters, drones, particular areas of expertise of his. And we formed a partnership out of that friendship uh, once I quit journalism, when I left it behind over a dozen years ago. And that led us to working first on Ghost Fleet and, and now our latest book. On a, décidé de vous... on a décidé de vous faire venir ce soir à cause de votre livre Ghost Fleet, La Flotte Fantôme, qui est sorti en 2015, où vous avez anticipé l'augmentation des tensions entre les États-Unis, la Russie et la Chine. On a décidé de vous faire venir parce que en France, <rire> on vient de se réveiller. On a décidé d'utiliser de, de, les capacités intellectuelles de nos auteurs de science-fiction pour faire de la prospective. La première question que je vais vous poser, c'est pourquoi les États sont obligés d'avoir recours aux auteurs de science-fiction et ne pas reposer leurs capacités sur leurs propres cellules de prospective It's a super question. And in 2022 is arguably one of the most important ways to unlock real insight into the future, especially the future of conflict. What writers, and particularly writers who are willing to do the research and write fact-based future fiction can do is better understand everything from aspects of future conflict like human-machine teaming, whether you can trust a robot, to a really big idea whether China is a nation that's capable of defeating the United States. One of the best things that writers can do in thinking about the future is talk about the things that nobody wants to talk about, that the status quo is often reinforced by everything from think tanks to government research reports, and those have their place. But we're at a moment where we have to be more creative. We have to think the unthinkable and find ways to integrate that into everything from defense planning to strategy to simply communicating with the public and helping them understand what's happening in the world, because that's often not done. There's too much people talking to themselves. And the novels that I've been writing with Peter Singer, the other work that I do, is very much about trying to address that. J'ai une question, c'est comment nos analystes, à votre avis, avec votre expérience, en sont arrivés à ne plus pouvoir penser en dehors de la boîte I think that is a question of incentives and also the medium itself. You know, there's the idea that the medium is the message that Marshall, I think, McLuhan quote from a long time ago. If all you're allowed to do is create PowerPoint briefs in a basement office in the Pentagon, it's very difficult to introduce a very disruptive idea that your boss may hate, that their boss may find unacceptable. And so the question then becomes, if you're working in an official organization, whether it's in the intelligence community or in a military service, one of their branches, what is the best way to break outside of that silo? And there is nothing better than story to do this. Humans are literally wired like machines to understand story, to share story whether it's written or spoken, it doesn't matter. But fundamentally, this is a very human endeavor. And the reason why I think it's important as well to, to think about this approach in an official way is that we have so much technological change right now, whether it's the rise of new forms of computing, like quantum computing, whether it's the rise of 
more sophisticated and autonomous drones, information and cognitive warfare, whatever the subject. What we often forget, and I see people missing in those conversations at the official level, is that we are all gonna live in that future. And this is a little bit like in the design community when you're trying to understand from a user experience, what is the actual problem that somebody faces? And that's very much how a good writer thinks, I believe, too, when they're taking this approach. Qu'est-ce qui vous a conduit, je pense, avant 2015, parce que vous avez dû euh, et commencer à écrire ce livre avant 2015, qu'est-ce qui vous a conduit à anticiper l'augmentation des tensions avec la Russie C'est un travail de terrain c'est un travail avec des sources ouvertes, c'est un travail avec des sources privées mais dans un réseau personnel, c'est votre intuition, c'est ou c'est quelqu'un qui vous a donné les informations parce qu'il n'arrivait pas à les faire comprendre à ses propres chefs. It's really all of those elements together. Maybe not the last one as much people telling us, you know, more or less what to to write, but the idea that when I think about what's a, what's a big issue worth writing a book about, because a book takes years, and you're really committing a lot of energy, emotional, intellectual, professional, there's risk in that it may fail, nobody may read it. Uh, in fact, with La Flotte Fantôme, it might have been easier for us to have written a nonfiction book. That would have been the logical, the, la the rational or linear approach. But the stakes for this question that we had come upon, which was, was the US underestimating China's military rise? And we definitively concluded yes. More so that it was very unpopular in 2013, 2014 to talk about in public China as a threat. M from an analytical perspective, but not, it was not a broadly or widely accepted conversation, in Washington, D.C. at least. This is true in the public sense. There was a U.S. Uh, naval officer who was fired at the time for saying so at a, co a public professional conference in 2000, I believe, 14. And even though we had a pivot to Asia, even though we had this idea that America had to reorient from Central and Middle East to the Asia Pacific, that's a lot harder to do than it is to declare a policy. But going back to the origin of the idea, when there is a large consensus around a concept, in this case that China was a nation that the US could overcome, the nation that China didn't master certain technologies. It wouldn't be able to really get a lead in AI or sixth generation jets, stealth, whatever. When there's a large consensus like that, my immediate response is, what are people missing? Like, what is the blind spot? Why does everybody want to believe that? So when everybody's looking this way, my instinct is often, what's over there, right? Another way to think about it is to simply invert the assumptions that people hold the dearest. Uh, another example that we explored in La Flotte Fantôme and Ghost Fleet was this notion of technological supremacy and how important that the U.S. at the time assumed that would be in a 21st century a world war, a global conflict. And so we started to unpack and look at things from a Chinese perspective. It's a little bit this red team in a war game sense point of view, where if you only play your own side, if you only think about things as you've been taught to and trained to and are rewarded to, you're often going to miss potentially the way an adversary is going to go about exploiting those assumptions. Any adversary worth their salt, as we say in English, whether it's the Chinese PLA, whether it's Russian intelligence, is going to look at the opportunities and find exactly how they can take those strengths that their adversary has and turn them into a weakness. So that was part of the process. Another aspect in that is this is a novel, a thriller, a techno thriller, but it has endnotes. It has hundreds of endnotes because we wanted to be transparent with our readers about what we were seeing, that the evidence is all there in the open, but you have to kind of put it together. And we used a creative vehicle to do this, a novel, but those endnotes and those in the story could have very well been the same endnotes for a nonfiction book. I've had some really interesting experiences. I was at Fort Benning in Georgia uh, doing a talk there. We have a, an American center where uh, infantry officers are trained. There's an airborne school. And I was getting a tour of the airborne jump facilities. And the, the master sergeant there is walking me through the, the, the field. And he, he says to me, he said, you know, the book checks out. And I was like, okay, like he liked it. He's like, no, I mean, I looked up every single footnote. I checked them all out, they're valid. 
the reason why I tell that story is that those are about establishing credibility with a military reader. I'm a civilian, right? I'm a writer. I'm not somebody who has those experiences, but I have an interest in those same issues. And being able as well to use those footnotes as a manner of establishing a bona fides of sorts, which is that we've done the hard work, the homework, and establish those facts, then, then we put them in the book so the reader can do their own research and maybe come to different conclusions. This is an important facet too, I think, when you're writing about the future. Some people feel they have to be right all the time when it comes to thinking about the future. They want to be the person who predicts the future. And I don't know that that's always possible. But the act of doing so, the process, is really, really valuable. Because you're able then, even if you don't get a precise prediction, you've at least hopefully gotten outside of your assumptions and your comfort zone and thought about some of the riskier, or more controversial ideas that may in, fact, may in fact reflect a reality of the future. Je vais reprendre le, le début de votre réponse. Euh, vous me dites, si j'ai parfaitement compris, que les Américains ou l'armée américaine n'avait pas anticipé la menace chinoise. C'est bon C'est vrai ou c'est pas vrai J'ai bien compris Moi, je vais, je vais me positionner en avocat du diable. Est-ce que vous connaissez la sécurisation du collier de perles par la marine américaine The collier de perles... Uh, les, les îles qui the, se the trouvent sur la, yeah, yeah, la principale, yeah, yeah, la principale yes. route énergétique chinoise. Yes. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que soit l'armée américaine ne sait pas ce qu'elle fait et crée ses propres démons, ou soit elle sait pertinemment ce qu'elle fait et qu'elle a pertinemment anticipé la menace chinoise selon elle en sécurisant la capacité de couper la route énergétique mm -hmm. et commerciale chinoise. Yeah. Donc, vous n'avez peut-être... Est-ce que vous pensez avoir des lunettes roses Je suis certain que certaines parties du the militaire américain, à the temps, avant 2015, 2014, 2013, sont très focalisées sur focused on exactly those kinds of sea lines of communication, those you know, resource access and choke points, right However, One of the biggest challenges in thinking about the kinds of conflicts that we're, think, that we're discussing is that you may have a certain part of the force, even intellectually, that understands the problem. But if our political leaders aren't taking it seriously, if the mandate isn't given to accept and acknowledge a threat because it's destabilizing to commercial relationships or other things, diplomacy, then it's a very precarious position to be at a national level strategically because there's a, a, dis a disconnect between the two. From a war fighting perspective, a war plans perspective, for sure. Uh, there are quite sophisticated and comprehensive plans for all kinds of contingencies, of course. But the difference is being able to act on them at a national level well before they're needed. And that's part of what I think we're trying to do with these kinds of projects, is to use them to create an awareness, which is to say, you may think an inevitability you're trying to avoid is 10 years away, maybe 12, 13. But you have to pretend, or prepare, I should say, that it's much, much more pressing, that it's coming at us potentially far sooner. Because we don't control how fast our adversaries advance, whether it's their strategic ambitions, their vision of their role in the world. Russia is a good example of this right now with Ukraine. Xi Jinping in China is a very good example as well. His transformation in the last four years to articulating a vision that's much more Mao-like, right, both domestically and externally. I think, I think that reconciliation is hard to do, and so we have to think about new ways to do it. Vous, vous me parlez de l'échelon politique. Quel regard vous portez sur le conflit irakien, le conflit afghan, ce qui s'est passé sur place, comment ça, ça a été annoncé je reprends l'exemple de Colin Powell avec euh, la fausse anthrax, ou la vraie fausse anthrax, ou l'anthrax la, neutralisé, ou la poudre de perlimpinpin, la farine, ce que vous voulez, mm -hmm. les armes de destruction massive qu'on n'a jamais retrouvées. Comment vous, en tant qu'ancien journaliste, analyste vous a, et américain, vous analysez le conflit irakien Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé Comment ça s'est terminé et, et, et les autres expéditions punitives que les États-Unis ont pu faire dans le monde pour apporter la démocratie pour les petites filles, et ainsi de suite. That's a very big question. Uh, cer time, man. Uh, certainly, um, in you know, having uh, on 9/11, I was in Chicago, and in, in the working in the Board of Trade Building 
as a journalist for, at the time, CBS Market Watch. And I remember looking up at the television that we had on the American cable news network called CNBC, it's financial news. And one of our jobs was to have that on all the time. And so you, you're kind of always watching it, but not really paying attention. And in a moment, you saw a flash of light that they cut to because they had been focusing on Twin Towers after the first act, plane hit it. But it was the second that was really the moment where you realized that everything changed. Because there was a very faint flash of white when that aircraft hit the second tower. And then as the image pulled back, the subsequent different shots, you understood better what was happening. And every American has a moment that they can reflect on and what followed in the weeks after that sense of numbness and shock. I think the military response into Afghanistan was a natural and correct reflection of that, right? Of trying to pursue the people who perpetuated the, the threat. When you look forward to the invasion of Iraq and the politics, the positioning of that, one of the things that was really troubling at the time was that different communities in Washington had different reasons and answers for why we needed to go to war. There was the threat of weapons of mass destruction. There was the neocon position of bringing liberty or democracy. And as an analyst, as a journalist, that felt very troubling that there was so much inconsistency. Not to say that any one of them didn't make sense to the people making those arguments, but to me, that was troubling. And it's something I've, I occasionally will think about because we're gonna have to ask ourselves as we do now with Ukraine and Russia, as we're going to have to do with China and Taiwan potentially, or some other part of the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, do we have confidence in political leaders who are making the case to take a nation to war? Is there a coherent message that's not just for, in my country's case, our population, but our allies too? So I, so I see the two as, as different in a sense, in having that ability to understand, in my case, the troubling signs when analyzing what happened. And having, of course, withdrawn from Iraq and most recently Afghanistan and seen the country fall, it's an incredible tragedy and one that, that should have been anticipated and has been incredibly painful for my friends who are in uniform and spent much of their careers in Boston. Anticiper quoi Anticiper le mensonge pour aller faire tomber Saddam Hussein Anticiper quoi Je comprends pas votre réponse. Oh, uh, in speaking about Afghanistan and, and understanding the fall of the country to the Taliban, the rapidity and speed with which that happened, caught many people off guard, and it shouldn't have. Um, Je parle de l'Irak. Oh, on Iraq, on the political positioning up front. Est-ce que vous vous rappelez de Colin Powell intoxiqué avec un mémo, uh, un mémo d'étudiant mm. sur le fait qu'il y avait des armes de destruction massive en Irak mm. Vous, en tant que journaliste américain, avec l'absolution historique de ce mensonge d'État, quelle est la perception des Américains sur ça Ils ont complètement oublié, ils ne savent pas de quoi c'était, ils ne savent pas placer l'Irak sur une carte, c'était il fallait tuer l'axe du mal. Quelle est la perception de la population par rapport à ce mensonge d'État Je pense qu'en 2022, ça a passé. Ce n'est pas quelque chose qui vient dans une conversation conversation. Il peut again. Again, like I was, I was trying to articulate the idea that when the state is asked to go to war, and we are always, as Americans, going to have to answer for what Powell said, right, to go to the UN like that. And that is something that is going to be just as vital when we think about the conflicts to come in the future, too. Because once you break trust like that, it's very, very difficult to build it back domestically. And I would say in this day and age, it gets harder and harder to do so because there is so much, so little, I should say, trust already in larger governments, bigger systems, organizations. And that's something that in the last two decades, literally, uh, has, has, has intensified and is only going to get more difficult. And can any nation ask and appeal to its people to support an operation like that again, a Western nation invading uh, another country. That's a very, very big question. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez du droit international et du droit international concernant la guerre Est-ce qu'on doit continuer à s'essuyer avec Est-ce qu'on doit remettre les fondamentaux sur la table Est-ce qu'il faut réexpliquer aux États que euh, 
le mensonge, c'est grave. Est-ce qu'on doit euh, tra traduire en justice George Bush Maintenant, Colin Powell, Powell est décédé, donc c'est plus possible. Est-ce qu'on doit traduire en justice un leader politique américain, président de son État, mmh. qui a menti Et est-ce qu'il faut traduire en justice tous ses conseillers, toutes les agences nationales, tous les directeurs d'agences nationales qui ont supporté ce crime de guerre Et les crimes de guerre inhérent à l'invasion irakienne. No, no, I don't, I don't think that. If I understand correctly. Vous reconnaissez pas la Cour pénale internationale, c'est ça? The, the International Criminal Court. Uh, no, but I, I don't think that it would, it would be sensible to, to try to, to try to do that to America's leaders in that era at the governmental level. No, no. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de collateral damage et ce qu'a sorti WikiLeaks? concernant les crimes de guerre américains Les euh, prisons, les tortures, Abu Ghraib, euh, les yeah. Irakiens déguisés en sapin de Noël avec des guirlandes, des guirlandes électriques et des cagoules, mm. euh, la torture. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de tout ça en tant qu'Américain, prospectiviste, ayant les mains dans ce, ce genre d'affaires Est-ce que c'est nécessaire de comprendre la psychologie de chaque côté pour pouvoir faire des, pré, des, des anticipations plus précises Mm. Si on sait qu'une puissance a tendance à mentir, est-ce qu'il faut le prendre en considération quand on établit une prospective So reckoning with our past to understand our future, if I understand correctly. It, it, we, so with, with an organization like WikiLeaks fundamentally changed the conversation in the US by offering primary source evidence, right, of Abu Ghraib, of other instances like that civilian casualties and for all the efforts that that we have made since in trying to move past that that fundamentally has changed how other countries perceive us and from an accountability perspective in from a foresight and futures perspective knowing that that is a part of conflict and that actually happened right that's not from someone's imagination and that the, the public has experienced that through wikileaks right through the media coverage through the the um The, 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 yeah, the, but, the, but to actually have, it's, it's not abstract to them in the way that they have experienced it. You can read a story, but you can actually now see an, a proper, the uh, original report. You can watch a video of a gunship, you know, hitting the wrong target. Uh, that is a new paradigm that is going to continue. And so in thinking about that and the ability of leaders to lie is crucial in being honest about thinking about what's coming in the future. It's certainly an aspect, I think, that you have to be able to consider that human aspect, the nature of power, the nature of how people will wield it, and how warfare has always a political element that many times has this domestic side to it. Est-ce que vous connaissez le général Wesley Clark? The American general from the 90s, former presidential candidate, yeah, yeah. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette personne? Est-ce que c'est une source fiable? Est-ce qu'il a déjà menti ou est-ce que c'est un vrai bon militaire américain, droit dans ses bottes, carré dans sa tête I don't have a lot of experience reading or I've never met Wesley Clark, so it'd be hard for me to say uh, generationally kind of where to fit, given his, you know, he was Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, correct. Um, but I don't, I don't have a strong opinion, having not spent much time, never met him or worked with him or anything like that. Comment vous approchez vos sources de première main Votre éditeur m'a dit que vous aviez des sources de première main directement au Pentagone. C'est eux qui vous approchent, qui vous tamponnent C'est eux qui viennent ou c'est vous qui les chassez mm. Est-ce que vous faites l'anaconda autour de vos futures sources Vous connaissez la technique de l'anaconda, qui mm. d'ailleurs a été mise en place en Irak avec le succès qu'on connaît. Est-ce que vous faites ça avec vos sources Est-ce que vous les chassez ou vous attendez qu'elles viennent à vous You know, having spent so much of my career as a journalist, I spent a lot of time learning how to, you know, talk to people and, and in many cases getting people to talk to me who didn't want to, to, bi to build trust. And, and that actually has served me really well as a writer of fiction because many of the people, when I, when I quit my job at the Wall Street Journal, I left it to go on this very winding path of using fiction and, and 
and I had this really interesting experience. I thought because that, working at the Wall Street Journal in the U.S. is a very prestigious job in uh, American journalism. And I thought, no, in Washington, D.C. is a place where your title and where you work matters. When you meet someone in Washington, D.C., it's quite funny. The first thing people say, where do you work, right? So it really, it really matters. So I walked away from uh, this job where when I told them where I worked, everyone's like, wow, right? Um, and I thought I would be essentially a nobody. No one would ever talk to me again, right? And I had a lot of really great sources who I trusted who brought me things sometimes. Sometimes I had to hunt them down uh, when they didn't want to talk to me. And you have a back and forth. Um, when I quit the journal, though, I had the most interesting thing happen is that people were happy. They said, this is great. Now we can finally talk. <laughs> They weren't worried about being quoted in the newspaper in the same way. And that was an interesting development because when you, over time, over a couple of years, I worked at the journal just under three years, you know, you, during, because of the intensity of the job, do get to know people pretty well because you're talking to them often in very stressful situations when you need something immediately and they don't want to give it to you or you're getting context, having a more, you know, casual conversation. But fundamentally about having been, I think, trustworthy in that sense, meaning that when you're reporting and covering, whether it's a company, a department, or an agency, uh, even breaking news, being the person that they want to talk to because they know you'll get it right. When people who are careless with facts or are inconsiderate with their sources, it's hard to develop a, a trusting relationship, even if there's a bit of antagonism to it. You want to be the person that when bad news happens, people tell you. So that's like my old journalism life. Now when working on these books like Ghost Fleet, which even though it has these really comprehensive footnotes, right, the end notes at the end that detail our primary source research, stories, articles, whatever, um, we're always looking to get the human element right because a good novel is about people fundamentally. And it's important almost at like an anthropological level to, to know how to convey what someone's reality is like. I'm constantly trying to understand what it's like to literally sit in someone's shoes or to stand in someone's shoes. Um, and I approach that with a lot of humility. Uh, and I think that is really, really important to never ever try to be in a position where you're telling someone, hey, I'm the smartest person in the room, I know more than you. Especially when you're writing about the future and things that haven't happened yet. Mais dire, dire à quelqu'un comment il doit être, c'est très américain de faire ça, non I mean, it's a big country. There's a lot of different kind of people. <laughs> no, but I mean, really, to, to do this work well, right, to go into rooms where I'm the least expert person, whether it's an area, you know, in, in the security realm or working with people who have far more experience than me, um, you know, understanding what I can bring to that conversation and being, being clear with myself about that and understanding what, what they have to offer, too, is really important. W what's interesting in the idea that you'd mentioned about whether we're kind of chasing people down for, for information or, or, or stuff, um, there's certainly times when we want to, um, you know, in, a, in Ghost Fleet, trying to, to describe what it's like to fly an F-35 fighter if you're being pursued by a Chinese missile. I'm not a pilot, I've never sat in an F-35, you know, that could fly. Um, so we reached into our community, uh, le, pardon, the F-35, right? Um, and... Uh, c'est l'avion qui, 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 qui est invisible sous la pluie, c'est ça? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any, any jet, there, there are no more stealth jets, whether it's rain, whether it's paint coming off them, or, you know, wideband radar. Um, so we reached into some of our contacts and relationships about people who flew these kind of jets and could get a little bit of perspective from that. And, you know, we're careful about things like classifications and clearances to, and, you know, people won't tell us things they're not supposed to, obviously. But it's really important because we want to describe uh, what it might actually feel like to be pursued by a Chinese missile that's homing in on a hacked piece of hardware on your own jet what it would be like to no longer trust your machine, right? That you've spent your entire career working to get in the, the, behind the stick on. And suddenly in an instant, you realize it's the biggest vulnerability of all and you're gonna die. Uh, that's a really hard thing to write as a layperson, right? As an outsider. So, so we do that. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a really critical part of why the work we do can connect. Now having written La Flotte Fantôme, having written Control, which came out in the U.S. in 2020, 
people come more and more to us to have conversations about what's coming, to ask questions about the future operating environment. And so those conversations get easier and easier each year. Another way of thinking about like these projects is that everyone is, in a sense, an experiment. When we wrote Ghost Fleet, La Flotte Fantôme, we had no idea whether anyone was going to read it, whether it would be laughed at for writing a novel, for emulating old Tom Clancy from 1986, uh, Red Storm Rising, uh, which in, on, on, in France has a different title, but... Um, Alerte Rouge. Oui, Alerte Rouge. Um, but we felt that it was worth the risk. Similarly with Control, We've written a book that's not about another war with China, right? It's not about that at all. It's set in Washington, D.C. It's a counterterrorism story. Attendez, attendez. On va venir sur les histoires d'intelligence artificielle de data un peu plus Certainly. tard. No, I, but I'm just making the point that, that every project is an experiment. <laughs> Pour nous. C'est pas une interview à l'américaine. C'est une interview à la française. Ouais, C'est super. <rire> Ça ressemble un peu à un interrogatoire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Je suis en train de voir. We'll que... <rire> Je suis en train de voir que vous essayez de m'emmener vers votre exact. prochain livre. Mais revenons à la guerre, mm. l'anticipation de la guerre. Quelle est votre prospective pour les deux années à venir Les deux années qui viennent. Qui viennent. Qui viennent. Um... Où est-ce que vous avez appris le français uh, J'ai passé une année à Lyon uh, quand j'avais 20 ans. Ouais, ça fait. Beaucoup de temps, mais... Votre foi s'en est remis hmm? Your liver feel better now uh, Un petit peu, mais... I, I, je vais continuer en anglais. <laughs> um, I have a lot of concerns about the next two years. Uh, the, particularly in light of what's happening in Ukraine. One of the things that worries me goes, goes to this idea of like national narrative, that from a... If you're Vladimir Putin, in thinking about the Russian story, and the remaining years he has in his life, and the power he's amassed, the money he's, he's, he's banked, the people who guard his money for him. He's the wealthiest man in the world, most likely. And he has a lot to lose personally, but yet has nothing to lose at the same time nationally. One of my worries is that one of the grand experiments that he was running with the invasion of Ukraine, where he attempted and wanted to have a surgical strike, an information campaign, which completely failed, is that that objective was very much about fracturing Europe politically, the NATO alliance specifically. And he well, still has other... The objective supposed by you. Par, yeah, for me. Yeah, he didn't... Yeah, yeah. So this is my analysis, right? This is how I make sense of it. And there are people who are more expert on Russia than me, to be clear. This is, again, something I need to be clear about. But, but I'm just going to follow my gut instincts. And he has still a few levers left, though, to try to achieve those goals. His information warfare campaigns aren't working, right? Which one? Putin. The, 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 the attempt to uh, fracture the NATO alliance, the coherence, right? But what if he were to take a step that involved a military strike against a NATO nation? Maybe an airfield in Poland where Javelin missiles are transitioning. Maybe it is against Finland, a neighboring nation which is recently planning on joining NATO to force the Article 5 discussion within NATO as a way to actually make the alliance decide what it's really about. And I've been, one of my biggest surprises, I'm sometimes asked, what surprised you about this conflict? And one of the things that has surprised me has been so far the unity in Europe and also across the Atlantic with the US, also with the UK, on supplying arms, on supplying resources, right? Uh, there was not a fracturing of that, of that relationship. But we're still early in this game. We haven't gone through a full winter yet without Russian energy. We still don't know what's coming in the fall strategically. And so the next two years to me seem really, really important from a next six months perspective. Because meanwhile, Xi Jinping, even though he may have an objective of taking Taiwan, whatever that might look like, by 2027 or whatever the, whatever the target might actually be, is certainly watching and, and learning and listening and seeing how committed America, particularly, is going to be to its European defense obligations, even while at the same time is, of course, creating new ones in the Pacific, like AUKUS, for example, with the UK and Australia. On dit qu'un bon analyste, un bon prospectiviste, doit être capable de penser contre lui-même. On va faire une expérience de pensée, vous et moi, 
je vais vous demander de penser contre vous-même face à la prospective que vous venez de me dresser concernant ce qu'il y a dans la tête de Poutine, ses capacités, ainsi de suite. Maintenant, je vais vous demander de penser contre vous-même et de me donner votre nouvelle prospective. This is where I, what Peter and I do, right? We're constantly going against each other. Uh, so to sit on the other side of the table from what I just said, one of the ways I might unpack that would be if Putin himself, in fact, knows... No, 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 no. Pensez contre vous-même par rapport à la prospective que vous, devez me, vous venez de me dresser, ouais. mes côtés américains. Quels sont les objectifs américains ah. Quelle est, Quelles sont leurs capacités d'organisation à long terme Vous parliez de Poutine qui s'est préparé pendant des années, et ainsi de suite. Ouais. Ok. Maintenant, je veux la prospective côté américain. Ouais. C'est-à-dire, pourquoi terme, quels, hein. sont, quels sont les intérêts américains mmh. me faites pas croire que c'est encore pour apporter la démocratie pour les petites filles, pour sauver la veuve et l'orphelin, parce que maintenant, ça marche plus du tout. En... Ça, ça prend plus en Europe. D'accord mmh. Donc, donnez-moi votre prospective concernant les intérêts américains. Parce que quand moi, en tant qu'analyste, j'analyse ce qui se passe, les sanctions énergétiques que l'Europe impose, c'est se tirer une balle dans le pied. Donc est-ce que les Américains... Je vais, je vais vous voler peut-être les mots de la bouche. Est-ce que les Américains ont un intérêt à ce que les Européens se tirent dans le pied dans l'échiquier international en termes de guerre économique mmh. Parce qu'il faut toujours penser avec plusieurs facettes dans son prisme de lecture. Vous êtes d'accord avec moi Je vous écoute. Quels sont les intérêts américains Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're in uncharted territory in the terms of this concept of, of economic warfare. And for American interests, our policy is going to have to suddenly come to grips with the fact that we just disconnected the West, Russia. And one of the long-term effects on our you know, trade relationship with Europe We just don't know yet. But America's overall interests, I think, are increasingly focused in a meaningful way actually on the Asia Pacific in terms of keeping China within its second island chain, keeping our allies, especially Australia, who we're realizing, I think, year by year is even more important for us in terms of power projection. And when you look at like the overall Chinese ambition for uh, Belt and Road, One Belt, One Road, Understanding that that is in the kind of uh, American naval thinking tradition, Mayhan like. You're trying to control the sea lines of communication globally. You're trying to control the information networks globally. We have to figure out ways to counter that. And the question is, I think, really important and, 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 and focused on this notion of whether that countering is economic and political or whether it is hard power, right? Is it more nested in defense? And so that, that, is, that is one of the abiding questions of how do you counter China? Because we're going to be living in a world where China's economy is larger than any other nation in the world, where their military spending may essentially become greater than ours by the end of this decade, where their military is more professional. Now, that has political implications inside China too, which is another conversation, but that is one of the abiding American questions. It's very hard to talk about which is how do you live in a world, what kind of nation can America be when China is going to be more, more powerful economically, which has never happened before for us, and potentially more, more capable and powerful militarily. Je vous rappelle que votre pays a 200 ans. La Chine en a 2000. Mm -hmm. La Chine est très énervée à ce que, avec ce que les Anglais leur ont fait. Ouais. Je pense qu'en termes ouais, de psychologie, ouais. euh, vous êtes des adolescents prépubères face à la Chine, non In a in a national narrative sense, what fascinates me about this question of legacy and history in China and and their anger over the opium wars is still very real. Um, but also, the Communist Party itself is still quite young, right You know, the Communist Party I think was formed in 1928. Was, the nation itself is 1949. You know, modern China. Um, One of the things I've wondered is how long can the Chinese Communist Party survive? The inherent contradictions in that society every year, especially as their technology sector grows, as their military gets more professional, uh, is going to force some really, really difficult moments for them. I mean, that's why in Flat Phantom we posited the Chinese Communist Party was gone. You know, that it, it just can't, it doesn't make any sense to run that country anymore. But there it is, suborning the PLA, managing an economy that doesn't respond to central planning. Um, 
It's a fascinating conundrum they have. And so, je peux yeah. vous arrêter Je peux vous arrêter Je voudrais avoir le même raisonnement sur les États-Unis maintenant. On va faire abstraction que vous soyez américain, mm. puisqu'entre analystes, aucune nationalité compte. Mm. Ce qui compte, c'est la prospective pure. Je voudrais avoir le, la réévaluation des intérêts vitaux des États-Unis dans votre bouche. Quels sont les intérêts vitaux des États-Unis Quelle est la capacité des États-Unis à survivre si l'hégémonie du dollar, ça ne fonctionne plus quelle est la capacité des États-Unis à survivre s'ils ne contrôlent plus les marchés financiers Quelle est la capacité des États-Unis à rayonner s'ils si ne sont plus la première armée du monde et si la monnaie du monde n'est plus la leur Quels sont les intérêts vitaux des États-Unis So one of the, the, the primary interests that this rise of China presents is how can you keep the global economy and political and cultural networks still aligned around a Western and open system, right? I, that feels to me like the most important thing the US needs to be able to do, to push back against that aspect of China's rise, because we can't, we can't afford to outcompete them economically. Our, our country is too small, which is a strange thing to say as an American, because our country is you know, the most you know, economically triumphant in the world. Has Trop petit intellectuellement parlant. No, not intellectually, I would say economically. Um, as a center of innovation, and this is part of this vision, right? If, if, America, yeah, if America loses its ability to be the place, and this sounds very cliche, where the smartest people in the world want to come and make money and be free, then we're going to be in a very bad place. If we have a society that's too extreme, too violent, too dysfunctional, that's all going to erode that. And it may be slow. It may be slow. C'est pas le cas à l'heure actuelle. It's, we're not, no, we're not there yet, thankfully. Yeah. Il y a pas des fusillades. Il y a pas une. 400 million guns in America, but thankfully. Il yeah. y a pas une augmentation drastique depuis 2000 des automutilations et des suicides. Mm. Euh, est-ce que la société américaine n'est pas profondément malade et est-ce que ces métastases ne sont pas en, en train d'irradier l'intégralité de la planète Quand on entend George Bush dire le train de vie des Américains n'est pas négociable, est-ce que vous ne pensez pas qu'il y a une, une remise en question, une conduite introspective qui n'est, que les Américains ne sont plus capables de faire parce qu'ils s'estiment les maîtres du monde I think every year it's going to get harder and harder if our political system continues to be dysfunctional. I think we can continue, especially as we are so interlinked, again, economically to a point. But the offer from a Chinese perspective, we have to, it's a competitive situation that we're in, especially with Europe. I think this is one of the abiding questions for China. Can, can China steal Europe away from the Western orientation towards across the Atlantic? That's a really profound strategic concept to consider because it is, of course, not a question of, as I said earlier, hard power, but of economic enticement and inducement of opportunity. And currently, because of the Chinese political system, it's repressive. It's not a place where, 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 where it's very difficult to do business. Uh, that's hard. But in the long term, 21st century, 100 year strategy, that the US, the US and China are looking at the end of the 22nd, 21st century and thinking about which nation is going to be thriving, then that question has to be answered. It's almost, a, some people have called it like the opposite. The, the ability to become almost, in our case, maintain the operating system of the world, as some people have described it, or if the Chinese are able to rewire that, because that affects everything from the primacy of the dollar to the ability to capture economic value and innovation, to control trade routes, the physical movement of, of objects. We may have revolutions in 3D printing that change the way goods are made in manufacturers that allow a, a, a national you know, awakening again of, of manufacturing. We may become less dependent on oil in the Middle East because of solar energy or maybe fusion. But fundamentally, the trade routes of the world will still be just as vital. And I sound a little bit old school saying that, but I, as much as I think about the future, you have to always remember the past. Uh, it's, again, one of those really, I think, foundational ways to consider what's coming, especially on a longer term. You know, much of the, much of the work I do is focused on the next 10 to 20 years, kind of at the outset of 20. But when you really think longer term to that 2050, 2060, I mean, you have to talk about space, of course, too. Uh, at least near space, uh, but especially just looking at the larger patterns of human movement 
you know, in the last two, 300 years, as we began to enter the age of maritime commerce, you know, and of course now we have aviation, uh, that's going to remain, remain just as important as it ever has been, even if it changes form slightly. Revenons aux intérêts, intérêts vitaux des États-Unis. Quels sont pour vous les trois principaux intérêts vitaux des États-Unis hmm. The first, I would say, goes back to this idea of being the physical place, even though we're going to enter a more virtualized world, where people want to come and thrive. The second would be creating a secure, from a defense perspective, global commons, and that means cyber, it means increasingly space, and of course the sea, that we can in fact let other people be, as they say in economics, free riders on our strength, right? That you can send ships across an ocean and not worry about them making it to the other side. That's a role that China has not wanted to play. It's very expensive, and we can barely afford doing it with our own Navy. And, and maybe with the third, I would say, The, the, the maintenance and, uh, and, and, and curation of relationships that served us well in the last century. And I think about the US-European relationship, our allies. There's another way of thinking about this third point, which is can you make new friends, right? Because we're going to have turmoil and turbulence in given countries. Some countries may peel out of our orbit. But the idea, though, is that if America is to be not only a place people want to come, like the first point, but simultaneously as we look out, we have to remain engaged in the world at that level and being able to keep people coming onto our side. And that's a question of, of course, trust, you know, to your earlier points about Iraq. It's a question of opportunity, the people uh, at a leader level, but also at a street level. And increasingly, and this is kind of my futurist brain, The, the way that a country like America can appeal to people is as much about an idea. And of course, ideas have inconsistencies and contradictions. I know that. But the notion of an idea, of a story, is still really, really important in international relations. And maybe even more so as we get more and more virtualized, that the idea is, in a sense, the thing. Quels sont les, les trois intérêts, les trois principaux intérêts vitaux des Européens Je vais faire un joke about croissant, uh, café. Uh, no, um, I would say the French fries. French fries. <laughs> French fries in France are actually Liberty wonderful. Liberty fries or French fries <laughs> With freedom fries. Uh, yeah, freedom yeah. fries. Yeah. Yeah. Oui. Um, C'est ça prendre le contrôle de la dialectique à l'américaine. Right. C'est renommer les frites. Right. French fries, yeah. Um, look, I mean, from a European perspective, if America is a young country, the European Union itself is still a very young experiment as well. You know, if you consider the idea of avoiding, when I, when I lived in France in the, in the mid 90s, during the kind of emergence of the European Union, it was very interesting to, to listen to French people talk about the rise of the EU as being a way to think about what to do with Germany in the 21st century. And so I think a peaceful Europe where the European Union is viable and allows an economic integration. And I'm not someone who completely believes that economic integration is, of course, something that can keep warfare from happening. Our two world wars in the, 20, in the 20th century proved that's not the case. But I think it does give you a better shot of avoiding conflict, of creating, I don't know if it's not shared values, at least shared interests. So I would say the European experiment Continuing is important. Being, I haven't talked about the idea of global warming and kind of the aspects of the reimagining of the energy economy. Europe may have a better lead at doing that than the US, and that has strategic advantage potentially. The third, I would say, <laughs> the third, I would say, is dealing with the societal transformations, and, I, and, and this is not me specifically trying to, to mention the book, but rather that we are in an era where populations are going to have fewer and fewer economic opportunities. And in Europe, there is a very high standard in the social contract, much higher than in America. What people expect in terms of healthcare, in terms of benefits, whether we have basic income, uh, that is going to be a very, very difficult problem, especially for Europe's wealthiest nations because people are very invested in what's happening, and it's going to be economically increasingly difficult to do, to fulfill those obligations. 
that has implications for everything from defense spending, because if you're looking at budgeting as a zero-sum game, meaning money from one account is going to go to the other, right? Do we pay for basic income, or do we pay for six-generation squadrons of fighters? That is a very difficult thing to reconcile and has huge implications. Uh, and it fascinates me as a question. Some of the, the short fiction that I've worked on has been trying to, to understand that even from a French, a French perspective. Uh, what, are the, what are the choices? You know, could France, for example, in this scenario, hold on to its army uh, of human forces in an era in the 2040s where many other European nations have automated their forces and keep them as a crisis element? It's roboticized. You put it in a cave or in a bunker, and you only use it when you need it. But there's cultural, there's political reasons to do that. And it's a really, from a futures perspective, like really, really interesting. And so it ties into that third notion about managing this, this, this problem. Quels sont les, les trois intérêts, les trois principaux intérêts vitaux de la Chine? Ah. The thing that I think about with China most often is if you're in Xi Jinping's perspective or you're a senior Communist Party official, is how do you keep the country from falling apart? How do you keep it a coherent political system? That is so hard to do there. The, the heterogeneity in the economy, in, in culture, in that society, given its scale, is is unprecedented in human history, especially as it collides with modernity. So my, you know, there's a phrase in Washington, D.C., you know, what are the biggest and most important factors in any situation? Trying to analyze and understand. Number one, it's politics. Number two, it's politics. And number three, it's politics. With China, it's a bit like that. What's number one? Keep the country from falling apart. Number two, keep the country from falling apart. Number three. <laughs> Et cetera. But, but to, to offer more specificity on alternatives for two and three, you have a demographic change in that society that's happening at the same time as an economic one, meaning you are going to look at an aging bulge of people who are going to require more and more care from the state, even though the economy is growing. At the same time, costs are rising. In the commercial sector for labor, you're seeing offshoring of manufacturing from China to Vietnam to other countries that are more politically palatable. Uh, and like Europe, that third point on balancing this notion of how do you keep a country, a population that large, at work, fed, feeling like they're thriving, invested in a communist party system that has so many contradictions. And, and that's a very expensive proposition, too, that if I were to try to think through what are the things that might undercut China's military and strategic rise, it's dealing with that, that last point particularly. Les trois intérêts vitaux de la Russie maintenant. <coughs> oh, that's, that's a very difficult one. Uh, it's, it's difficult for me uh, because I keep seeing it through the perspective of somebody like from Vladimir Putin's point of view. So, so that's how I'll answer it. Um, Vous avez déjà été en Russie? Non, jamais. Jamais? Jamais. Est-ce que c'est possible de faire une prospective sur un pays sans jamais y avoir mis les pieds? It's a great question. Uh, I think it's a lot harder. Absolutely. Um, one of the... Je, je vais préciser ma question. Sans y avoir mis les pieds, et si c'est sur place, si les gens sont sur place, S'ils ne sortent pas de ces petits cercles d'expatriés qui pullulent comme de la vermine dans les salons feutrés des ambassades. The idea that you know, if you're a professional expatriate, you could just is be in any international capital. I think that's that's possible. I mean, in my experience, I, I, it's funny. I actually used to want to be an, the ambassador to Russia. I was really into skateboarding when I was you know 10, 11, 12 years old, and at the same time I was doing that, I was studying. Russian with a tutor at the University of Washington, Seattle. I would literally get picked up, driven to the, I would use a Georgian PhD Maladiet. student. <laughs> 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 Non, mais vous connaissez des gros mots en russe Des gros mots, non. Non, 
Ah non, 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 je ne connais pas. Pas du tout <rire> Non. Non, ah, vous connaissez Moi, j'avais 12 ans. Euh... <rire> ah oui, mais, mais à 12 ans, moi, je connaissais déjà pas, toutes les insultes aux états unis J'ai pris pas ça. <rire> Est-ce que vous pouvez connaître un pays sans connaître la base de la langue, la, yeah. ce qui anime un peuple On dit que l'architecture d'une langue détermine l'architecture de la pensée. Mm -hmm. En France, en français, pardon, on a besoin de 30% de mots en plus par rapport aux états unis yeah. ça, nous, ça nous gêne dans le business, parce qu'ils ont pas l'arbre. D'accord Les états unis ouais. et le monde anglophone, et spécialement le Commonwealth, n'a pas ce problème-là. Parce qu'ils utilisent 30% de mots en moins. En russe, vous avez la capacité, en une seule phrase, de dire 13 sens de mots. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Est-ce qu'on peut connaître un pays, un peuple, comme aux états unis pareil, mm. si vous ne connaissez pas les petites ramifications d'une langue Je pense que c'est vraiment difficile de comprendre une culture profondément without having had experience in that language. I think it's, it's really hard. Um, I think as somebody who tries to use fiction and imagine, not just other societies, other cultures, other jobs, other whatever, uh, but also the future itself, if you can start by understanding what you don't know, and this is a bit about like what I was saying earlier, that helps you avoid some of that, that trap. But But absolutely, there's a, um, you know, one of the experiences we had, uh, it's not a secret, but it's, a, it's an aspect of Ghost Fleet, La Flotte Fantôme. I'd never been to Hawaii. And we wrote extensive scenes in Hawaii. Sans, sans spoiler votre livre, donnez un petit apéritif à nos lecteurs sur quel est le début du conflit, comment ça s'est passé, comment ça se passe, quel type de technologie sur place, quel type de réaction. In, in La Flotte Fantôme The story starts actually with an energy discovery, right? With China having a moment where literally there is a before and an after in realizing they can achieve a form of energy independence. But the most, the most chilling way the book, when you get past that, starts is the actual, how does the Third World War begin, right? This question of, does it begin with uh, a missile that flies over the North Pole, right? Is it a submarine lurking and sinking an aircraft carrier? Writing that book, we thought a lot about this question. This is maybe the most important question. Une attaque sous faux drapeau? Well, a false flag is part of how it works. Um, but we began first with war in space, right? And looking at it from the position of an American astronaut on the International Space Station. And I'll um, tip a spoiler, uh, who is locked out by these Russian cosmonauts because they're taking the station over. And Quite quickly, the story moves to Hawaii because, a little more spoiler, China seizes Hawaii, which is on one level an outrageous question to pose. Could this really happen? But they use a, a way of invading with special forces, not unlike how they invaded Afghanistan in 1979. So the Chinese use roll-on, roll-off cargo ships to pull up to the pier. First, there are cheap Chinese SUVs that are coming to the local market, and the next thing is a tank, and then an armored vehicle, and another tank. And that sort of deception, you know, how do you hide in plain sight anymore, right? This is something that we're thinking about now with Ukraine, of course. How do you mobilize an invasion force that's capable of seizing territory from the United States? This is... Des exercices militaires. That's, that's the old way, right? It's effective, right? I mean, the Russians did it. I mean, it's, it's the narrative, you know... Autant aussi. Yeah, but the exercise that NATO performs doesn't involve crossing into, you know, Russia, uh, just like Russia crossed into oh, Ukraine. C'est une opération militaire spéciale. <laughs> right. C est, c est, tout est une question de vocabulaire, que ce soit yeah. chez les Russes ou les, les Américains. And also object, of objectives, I think, too, right? Uh, and sometimes, of course, you know, you have the deterrence, the aspiration to deter by showing what you're capable of by engaging in the complex maneuver and movement of tens of thousands of forces, in NATO's case, different, different nations. In our case, we do a few nations. Um, I don't know if military exercises actually offer any deterrence, uh, but that's another conversation. Um, but, but this notion, though, of uh, how do you understand an environment without having been there? And we had a review from one of the newspapers in Hawaii, the Honolulu Star Advertiser, And my co-writer had been to Hawaii a little bit. Uh, but 
they were really pleased with how well we described Hawaii. And you know, from a practice perspective, seeing that it passed muster with them, that they received it well, it alleviated a lot of stress I had. And I kind of, I, I thought, I never want to make that mistake again of writing a book and not going to the place and seeing the ground, talking to people uh, again. Uh, and maybe that's the conceit of a first novel is you know, trying, needing to do that, right? We didn't really have much choice. Um, but I feel like that was a really, really big moment of realizing that you know, creatively, sometimes you take that risk and it can pay off, but it, but it also might not. And that, and that is back to the idea of credibility. You know, just like you're trying to understand the language that a culture speaks, you know, as a civilian writing about the military, there is a similar way of speaking that's vital to understand. And it's not just using acronyms, the shorthand. You know, if you sit in a bar with people who are coming back from deployment or going to deployment, the actual conversation they have is quite acronym rich that to an outsider is impenetrable. And that's part of the culture, right? Having that, that unique language. Um, but being able to essentially try to better understand how to communicate with people in the military who are your readers, who are also needing to believe the story you're creating, especially if it is said in the future, maybe they think it's far-fetched or not possible. If you're really pushing the boundary a bit of, of what's possible, it's vital to be able to try to get into that, that kind of language. And that's not just about dialogue, about having a character say the right thing. It's also about understanding what, what and again, in that anthropological way, what matters to them? How do they relate to their families? How do they, how do they deal with outsiders? Uh, those are all sort of the crucial aspects, I think, of that, you know, what you call world building. Ce qu'il vote Ce qu'il vote, peut-être Peut-être, yeah. Um, you know, these aspects, I think, are, are... There's another way I think about this, too, uh, you know, in this, which is, it's not what facts and details you have in a story that are important, it's what you leave out, right? Really understanding, just giving a reader enough that they can make part of the movie in their own mind, but also allowing them, I would like to think, to learn a little bit too. Because there's nothing worse, there's nothing worse than reading something where you feel like you're, you're, you're being lectured, like too, right? Or you're losing the ability to place yourself in that movie. When I write, I literally watch the movie, you know? And this is just how my brain works, every writer's different. But especially in writing thrillers and techno thrillers where it's very visceral, there's action. We're talking about fighter jets and ghost fleet or submarines and, 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 and everything. Um, it's really important for me to be able to see the scene, right? And to kind of move around it uh, in those different perspectives. And that allows you, I think, to really understand as if you're literally telling somebody, what's, hey, what happened, right? From an analytical and kind of narrative perspective, to me, that's one of the easiest ways to get through writer block, writer's block, is, is to answer that question, what's happening right now? Like, what just happened? It's a very fundamental point that people often lose sight of when they get kind of wrapped around their own ideas. On va parler un peu cuisine. Et... L'intelligence artificielle, les robots avec capacité de prise de décision euh, létale, les capacités que les militaires délèguent au, au complexe militaire ou industriel, les drones, euh, les drones autonomes, que ce soit dans les airs ou sous la mer, ou les chiens patrouilleurs. Mmh. Euh, comment vous voyez l'avenir en termes de technologie et les répercussions que ça va pouvoir avoir sur les populations civiles Qui analyse le code de l'intelligence artificielle Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas des biais de programmation qui, Comment vous voyez l'avenir sur les questions d'artificial intelligence mm -hmm. one, of, one of the ways I, I think about that is what's it like to live in a world in which all these technologies, whether it's robot police dogs, whether it's facial recognition software, everywhere I go, how does that change you know, how I behave? But not just how I behave, but how I think. Uh, you know, the idea of self-censorship in certain regimes is something that people develop naturally. You know, can you enter into an era of total surveillance where everything from the watch you wear, the car you just got out of, 
uh, the restaurant where you're eating. It's already there with your credit card and your iPhone to some extent. Um, we're at a point where that is going to like that. And the question is, what next? Fundamentally, when I think about like this AI and roboticized world is, you know, what is the world that I want to live in, right? And from to work backwards from there. And, and that to me means if I were to break this down a little bit, you know, thinking about the ability to not feel, to feel in a human sense, like you're constantly surveilled. That's an extremely stressful and uncomfortable and I think detrimental experience to have. And we're already there. And it, there's a little bit like that, uh, you know, quote about being paranoid, you know, uh, which I'm gonna probably not say correctly. Um, but the idea that, you know, if it's not that you're, let's see, it's not that they're not watching you, you're just not paranoid enough or something like that. And between our, our iPhones, right, and our credit cards, the amount of data that you can use to model someone's behavior and with AI, you know, twin them and create essentially a factotum of their life, of their existence, begins to fundamentally alter the relationships that we have with one another. And what's maybe most troubling about that world is not realizing it, right? It's people who essentially move forward, swiping on apps, tapping a phone to pay, and don't actually see all this happening. Because one of, the, Google? one of the vexing things about many of the most effective technologies like this is they're invisible, right? We don't perceive them. And this is, I think, one of the really interesting challenges with AI, because if someone is to be upset or even enraged about uh, an AI-based decision-making, maybe it's on their credit report, maybe they failed to get a loan, they don't know that that software was based on data that was never going to let them get a loan in the first place be because they didn't have the right profile. And we don't have that understanding at a civil society level of how any of this stuff works. So it's a question of both education, right, as much as policy. Prenons un cas concret. Le droit à l'avortement aux États-Unis. Quand certains États sont capables de poursuivre en justice certaines femmes qui ont avorté, et certains États utilisent leur historique de recherche, leurs livres consultés, les choses qu'elles ont pu commander. Vous avez entendu parler de cette histoire C'est... Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Est-ce que c'est mettre en danger les femmes C'est-à-dire les obliger à encore avorter avec des aiguilles à tricoter C'est le puritanisme américain qui se remanifeste parce qu'il a peur Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça Est-ce que la violation de la vie privée, on se rendait, dont on se, se, ne se rendait pas compte réellement, est-ce que, par exemple, l'histoire de l'avortement et des gens un peu euh, produits, euh, du moins yeah, persécutés en justice Cette année va être un très, très chargé dans les US, parce que la US Supreme Court est le plus likely to essentially rewrite, allow states to rewrite abortion laws, to be far more restrictive. It's horrifying. And what that also, to your point, means that we're going to have to think about this question of privacy in a very real way. This is not an abstract issue. When, so someone, when somebody who has a, an app that tracks their menstrual cycle, and suddenly that is potentially data that state law enforcement in a state that has a restrictive abortion law could use to prosecute them, maybe even if they're out of state when they got an abortion, to use their location data, credit card receipts, And we don't have any meaningful conversation about that. And you asked, is it too late right, to be able to have that conversation? There's a real risk of that. There are many, there, there is a chance that we will have to have that debate quite soon. But when you look at how laws are made in the US, when you look at the movements that were required at the political level to change something as fundamental as data rights, which is not a hot button issue in America, nobody cares, but it's vital. It's going to require, and maybe this is one aspect of what happens with the repeal of Roe versus Wade, is that it forces a very real and immediate conversation that leads to some action on data protection. But that's from a policy perspective. From a corporate perspective, on the other hand, what is the moral and ethical obligation of a technology company, right? 
And, and that is something that I don't think we've had any debate on publicly yet, and we need to, absolutely. Causing harm, I mean, if you think about the ability to cause harm with you know, electrons, right? You know, there's myriad ways to do that, with algorithms more specifically in social media. How do we then advocate for ourselves as individuals when politicians may not care, right? I mean, this is a question of not just advocacy, but, but determinism. And I, I, I like to say I'm an optimist who stares into the abyss, right? I, I, I believe in human potential and possibility, but I have a lot of sleepless nights thinking about all the things that may happen in the future or in the near term. And, and this is one of those periods that's been really hard, thinking about that and trying to come up with something that, that doesn't take me out of a very dark and very, very depressing uh, you know, next, next year or so with this regard. If, if, I want, if I want to be hopeful, it's that sometimes change comes from an or, orthogonal, uh, an, an, an alternative, an outside perspective. So perhaps a debate, people in the streets over abortion, forces us also to finally come to grips with this question of data and privacy, because it has such very real implications for the safety and security of women in America. Quel regard vous portez sur la NSA Quel regard vous portez sur l'affaire Snowden Quel regard vous portez sur le fait que la NSA récolte, moissonne depuis des années des data partout dans le monde, qu'elle a stocké pendant des années, qu'elle maintenant, grâce à des capacités de calcul, elle peut traiter Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de l'affaire Snowden I, I look at the Snowden affair as... And again, like, it feels like one of the most successful intelligence operations, potentially by Russia, that, that we've ever seen. Um, Attends, j'ai pas bien compris là. Vous m'avez dit quoi? Looking at the revelations that Edward Snowden was able to produce by stealing data, right, and files, and to have him end up in Moscow as a fugitive by way of Hong Kong, feels to me. And this is a, you know, this is my 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 conspiratorial, you know, spy novelist uh, mindset, like like a like a like an operation that you couldn't I couldn't make that up and write it. Uh, that's my gut instinct in, in looking at that. Vous n'avez pas des copains programmeurs? I have a lot of friends who are programmers. Yeah. Et, et, et vous discutez avec eux? Yeah, yeah. Ils oui. sont en première ligne de, le, de, de des algorithmes. Ils sont en première ligne. La majeure partie des programmeurs que nous, on connaît, ils ne veulent plus travailler à ça. Et ils ne sont pas recrutés par des services extérieurs. Yeah, this is one of the big tensions since Snowden, is what is the US, what is Silicon Valley, and I mean Silicon Valley in California, but you know, more broadly, what is their relationship with NSA, CIA, intelligence services, government in general? Because there is, on one hand, a desire to reject a small number of people who are saying we need to work on national security problems. But at a, at a kind of keyboard level, there's still a lot of antagonism. And I expect that's, that's a question of, again, of trust. Um, but when you ask about what do I think about that Snowden situation, it's like all the hair on the back of my neck just goes up because it just, the, the inner logic of it doesn't, didn't make sense to me and still doesn't. Uh, as being anything but an intelligence operation. And maybe I'm too conspiratorial. Uh, Pourquoi ça n'a pas de logique Quand vous voyez que votre constitution écrite par les pères fondateurs est dévoyée par votre armée, you blow the whistle, mm. like, uh, like Chelsea Manning, mm. like Snowden, on tire l'alarme. Est-ce que les Américains, est-ce que les Américains, est-ce que les Américains n'ont pas oublié les valeurs des pères fondateurs? Mm. No, I think uh, uh, this is one of the big conversations in America about you know founding values right now, and I think the ideas of freedom, right? Um, but how you blow the whistle matters too. In the context. Vous traînez trop avec les militaires. <laughs> Vous parlez comme un militaire. 
quand j'entends, quand je vous entends parler, c'est-à-dire mettre ça sur le point d'une opération russe grâce à Snowden, vous savez pourquoi il a terminé en Russie, Snowden mmh. Parce que c'était le seul État qui était capable d'assurer sa sécurité contre les kidnappings et les tentatives d'assassinat de la CIA. To me, I... Nous, on voudrait bien l'accueillir en France comme... Euh, Yeah. Comme Julian Assange. Right. Mais comme votre pays fait des opérations chez nous à longueur de journée, mm -hmm. on ne peut pas assurer leur sécurité parce qu'on est trop mauvais face à vous. Mais si vous leakez des documents avec l'idée que vous advocatez pour la liberté et la liberté et une expression de valeurs qui sont, à votre point, à votre point constitutionnel, je ne sais pas comment vous décidez d'aller à un endroit où ce n'est pas safe de dire ce que vous voulez. A place like Russia. Mais vous, This question of physical security, I don't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem to be... Je prends un, un cas concret. Je prends un cas concret. Vous êtes dans un service de renseignement et vous voyez par exemple l'opération Stellar Wind. Mm -hmm. Vous connaissez l'opération Stellar Wind C'est quoi l'opération Stellar Wind The surveillance of AT&T and other data centers in the US. Attendez, attendez. L votre réponse n'est pas complète. Qui est-ce qu'il y a derrière oh, AT&T Oui, yeah. d'accord. Mais qui est-ce que la NSA surveille Des citoyens américains On American citizens. Voilà. Yeah, so using American Ça, telco... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So using American telco nodes to, to capture domestic data, which is forbidden. D'accord, it's forbidden. Yeah. Ah, right. Ce qui était interdit, right. ou ce qui... Ce qui on sait, ce, hein. Vous êtes dans cette société, et vous allez voir votre euh, supérieur hiérarchique, et vous lui dites... Ah ben vous savez pas quoi On est en train de pomper les données de notre propre pays sur notre propre concitoyen. Et moi, j'ai appris à l'école que dans la Constitution, on n'a pas le droit de le faire. Qu'est-ce que vous croyez que votre N plus 1 va faire Il va vous écouter Il va appeler la police Ou il va dire tu te tais parce que sinon tu perds ton travail où il, te, où il va te dire, tu te tais, sinon j'appelle le FBI et je vais t'accuser, avec ce nouveau maccartisme, néo-maccartisme, je vais t'accuser de trahison. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que c'est plus patriote que d'être obligé d'aller se réfugier chez les Russes parce que votre propre État est devenu sourd et aveugle Non, je ne pas. Je pense... The way that I would have think, thought about that would be to go to some of the lawmakers in Congress, potentially, a, a Jane Harmon, somebody like that, and their committee and staff, right, who work on the Intelligence Committee. And, and if you're willing to jeopardize, you know, national secrets too, sure, right? I mean, because there's a cost in, in whistleblowing, right? I mean, there's a trade off. But to, it doesn't, it's still, I can't get my head around going to a country like Russia, Germany, maybe. Going to a member of Congress and working with the committee is a much more, to me, the inner logic of it is more coherent. The effect would still be the same, because even if you release the information out there. But to find haven in Putin's Russia, just I can't, I can't get my head around it. Shall we pa? C'est parce que vous êtes américain, c'est pour ça. I am very American. <rire> revenons, revenons aux data. Euh, quand, on voit, quand on voit à l'heure actuelle que nos data sont siphonnés et que nous sommes tout nus, vous comprenez l'expression tout nu tout We are nul. all naked right. in front, en face de la, des business, des corporations, des services de renseignement, que ce soit le vôtre, le nôtre, le Mossad, le mm. GRU, le FSB et je vous en passe, les meilleurs. Nous, en tant que société civile, que doit-on faire selon un prospectiviste Je pense que vous devez regarder ça en deux différentes pièces, le privé et le gouvernemental, et figure out où vous pouvez faire plus de progrès. Je voudrais like penser que, en parallèle, vous pouvez faire le cas pour, sur le commercial side, true ownership of your own data, and that it has actually economic value, so that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when we have fewer hours available for us to work, that whether it's selling our data or our data is traded you know, for advertisers or whatever, that there's some economic value. Is that a solution to basic income? It's a little bit dystopian, but 
Um, so is that 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 you know trend line. Uh, on the government side, the levels of encryption that are available today and that are coming with quantum with with quantum computing are fascinating in this regard because there's two ways that can go. And so when I project on the government side of the individual versus the state, avec les calculateurs quantiques, there's both the ability to break open any secret everywhere. I mean, what an era that would be to see. It'd be fascinating. Incredibly destabilized. C'est déjà le cas, non Et... Pourquoi vous soulevez les sourcils non mais il faut nous donner de l'information concrète. Est-ce que les États-Unis ont déjà la capacité de briser tous les mots de passe comme les Chinois peuvent le faire mm. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I imagine the intelligence services of every country are trying to break every code everywhere. Uh, but I don't. I really. I mean, I'm a. You know, I don't know. But what on the quantum side again, to using my kind of like foresight brain. There is of course the idea that with quantum computing all the data that the Chinese have stolen can suddenly be unlocked. That's one, that's one thing. And that's a, hell, that's a heck of a big threat. Uh, because suddenly, with AI, you can model a society and manipulate it. But, 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 I'll, but I'll, just, I'll just say quickly. Je, je, je vous coupe. Quelle est la différence, pour nous, Français, que ce soit les Chinois qui nous volent nos données ou que ce soit les Américains qui nous volent nos données In terms of stealing the data or yeah. taking the data. Alors, me dites pas, euh, les États-Unis, c'est the land of the free. Et, là, <laughs> et puis, puis, parce que sinon, je vous fais la petite musique derrière avec les violons et les flûtes. D'accord right. Donc, quelle est la différence pour un Français de se faire avoir par les Chinois ou de se faire avoir par les Américains Parce que je veux bien, les Chinois torturent les Ouïghours, stérilisent les femmes Ouïghours, mm -hmm. font du crédit social, mangent des enfants, ce que vous voulez. Mais les États-Unis torturent, mentent, envoient des armes à uranium appauvri en Irak, partout. Ça donne des enfants avec des cancers. Ils nous ont même, nous, Français, bombardés avec du LSD en 1960. Hein Donc quelle est la différence, pour nous, entre les États-Unis et la Chine Oh, I mean, I, it's a bit like the thing that makes you want to play music, but ultimately, it's the intent of the government, right? I, absolutely matters. And it's similarly for me, if, if, if the French are stealing my data or the Chinese are, on, on one level, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're losing ownership of your information. But ultimately, I have less concern about that former versus the latter, right? The national and the strategic objective is different. The utilization and weaponization of information, particularly of the kind that is stolen, whether it's modeling your email for a future spear phishing attack, whether it is the ability to duplicate or replicate your online existence during a war. I don't worry about France doing that to me. I worry about Russia, too, or excuse me, Russia, yeah, but also China, right? So the context is everything to me. And that's not to take anything away from a clear-eyed look at history. But looking at where we are now and what's happening in the future, I can't, I can't see equivalency between the two, even when it comes to something as core as, as data. Vous parlez de militarisation des données, euh, militarisation de la pensée, donc. C'est-à-dire que, je prends un exemple. Imaginez-vous que vous réalisiez quelqu'un qui ressemble à Donald Trump, mm. mais sous stéroïde, bien, bien, bien costaud, bien énervé. Il a en sa possession des lames de rasoir pour faire chanter des juges, chanter... Euh, comment il s'appelait votre Américain président euh, qui est parti, le Watergate C'était comment ça uh, Richard Nixon. Ah, Richard Nixon. Right. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que vous êtes... Oui, c'est une joke. <rire> vous ne pensez pas qu'on est en train, ou votre lobby militaro industriel ou votre lobby de la Silicon Valley, est en train, ou votre lobby de la NSA, est en train de donner des lames de rasoir à des singes mm. So, if I understand correctly, it's the idea... I can speak slowly, if you want. Well, if that's... <laughs> right. uh, I understand the idea that all these tools that the intelligence community in the US, particularly military for that matter, has assembled can just as easily be used in the hands of an evil president 
against its own citizens, right? Just like an authoritarian regime like China. Absolutely something I would worry about. Because... Ça vous inquiète ou pas, là? Yeah, absolutely. Because these are very powerful tools, and we've just come through an extremely disturbing presidency with President Trump. And he may run again, he may win again. And what does that period of time look like? So this question again about being able to consider the role of the individual in that society that's being brought up with data as comes to Roe versus Wade earlier, has implications, right? In 2023 during the run up to the election, 2024 during the election itself. I think every Western citizen, whether it's in France, whether it's in Germany for that matter, whether it's in the US, needs to be constantly mindful of that what we're using a technology for today that may be done in the public interest, which is always attention, certainly, at the flip of a switch can be wielded against you. And so at that constitutional, at that foundational level, it's something that's not abstract anymore. It's real. And, and, and trying to think about ways to get people to care about that is important because it's, there are a lot of complexities to that question. Montrez-moi votre livre. Magnifique. Est-ce qu'on peut parler de ça un peu plus en détail Je vous écoute. Pourquoi avoir écrit ce bouquin-là You know, the answer I just gave is in part part of it, right You know, the, the idea that we are living in societies where we know everything about us and yet sometimes nothing, right? And feel like we don't have a voice or agency. And imagine uh, in America 15 years from now where far fewer Americans have jobs that they find meaningful, that there is more resistance and organizing on the far right by politicians, but also by other people who are very interested in, almost in an anarchic sense, creating chaos. And I'm not even pinning anything on the Russians. There's no Russians in this book. <laughs> this, this is a domestic issue. And, and so the idea that you can find yourself in a world in which everything that you felt worked great suddenly doesn't, because there's been a paradigm shift economically, politically, culturally, that's what motivated us to write this book, Control. We are moving headlong into an era in which AI and robotics are going to transform every aspect of society. It's going to transform the fundamental things that give us our identity, what, what jobs we do. It's going to change everything from how politicians, in a sense, are able to message us, but also control their populations with these very same technologies. Nobody wants to talk about this. This is not a popular discussion. This is like a really depressive uh, 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 line of thinking. You know, I'll, I'll often like finish a coffee with someone, and we both kind of look at each other. And we're just like, God. But that's why we write, right? We're trying to allow people to understand the things we want to avoid. That was true with Flood Phantom. It's true with control. We need to understand and think the unthinkable. What we might be missing about the world now because it's uncomfortable. We don't want to think about it. And to me, a novel is a perfect way to do that. You can still be entertained and kind of have that heightened awareness. And I think that's crucial to be able to do that in a manner that's accessible to anybody. Anybody can read a book. You don't even have to buy it. Go to the library. Uh, my hope is that by understanding these very complex questions about technology from a human perspective, from you know, this, this FBI agent, and not just her, but her family. I mean, this is a novel that's about an FBI agent hunting her terrorist nemesis, her robot partner, but, but also her relationship with her husband and her daughter. And her husband was a lawyer who went to American Ivy League universities, the Grand École, never did anything wrong in his life. A good guy, somebody who in America believes the system owes them something. And because of an algorithm at his law firm, his very high paying job was taken away. And that has profound implications for our hero, right? Because she's not only become 
the sole breadwinner, the sole income in their household, but also the very nature of what she has to do to save Washington involves working with a robot that her husband despises. She hates, he hates the fact that she's working with the very technology that's made him miserable, that's ruining society. And that contradiction to me is fascinating. And this is a really human experience, right? It's a very different kind of story than La Flotte Fantôme for this reason. It's very much about getting inside the heads of people who live in this future America. Sur les data, sur le, le, le fait que la machine va nous remplacer, on va complètement changer de sujet l'espace d'un instant. Est-ce que vous attendez à des émeutes aux États-Unis à cause de la condition sociale qui se dégrade Est-ce que vous pensez que votre euh, démocratie est en danger car votre système est pourri, qu'il met trop de gens dans la précarité et que l'humain n'est peut-être pas fait pour vivre avec the American way of life. Mm. Uh, inequality is a structural problem in America that may, could, could ruin the country in the next 20 to 30 years. Our inability to educate our young, to take care of our sick, and I, and I sound uh, you know, pessimistic here, but we have very little meaningful progress to tackle these problems in a meaningful way. And that's not even to speak of gun violence, but just simply looking at education and healthcare. You know, creating economic opportunity in a world, if America, we talked earlier about these kind of three paradigms, right? If you want to be the place where you want the smartest people to come, it would be sensible to try to be the place where you have some of the most best educated and smartest in a, in a, in a broad sense in the world. You can't outsource innovation, right? And there is very little interest politically in doing that. It's extremely disheartening. As someone who has children and looks at the future, I'm constantly weighing this question of, is the world going to be worse? Is there a chance it can be better? And again, that's not even considering climate uh, and global warming. And so part of writing a story and spending you know, two years thinking these dystopian thoughts, living inside, in my head, that apartment that Laura Keegan lives in, is about coming to grips with this paradigm of how we're just simply not rising to the occasion when we know what we need to do and nobody wants to, to allow great economic inequality in America. And I'm not a socialist at all. I'm a capitalist for sure. Uh, but to allow such yawning inequality. Is it quoi? Uh, I'm not a socialist. Je suis pas socialiste. Capitalist. I, you know, come, come on. Capitalist, ça veut rien dire. Well, no, les marchés, les marchés, ouais, 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 les comme, marchés sont ouais, administrés, ouais. non? Oui. Oui. Ouais. Uh, the ability to allow such extreme wealth, and this is again a theme in the book, to allow an executive who runs a multi-billion dollar corporation to make hundreds of times the amount of their employee, that doesn't make any sense. And I spend a lot of my career as a financial journalist, right? Interviewing executives, interviewing employees, covering the biggest bankruptcies, some of them in America, seeing the rise of the first internet economy and its crash, seeing the airline industry crash after 9-11, seeing the second dot-com crash. I've covered all this stuff, the bankruptcies, the auto industries. I've seen the economic carnage that can happen. And, and we're still unable to understand how to make our society more resilient, right? And, and as someone who specializes in defense, who works in and around these issues very seriously with intent, I still think we don't pay enough attention to these softer issues. It's so important to consider national dynamism, not just in terms of an order of battle, the strength of a military, but how are we going to take care of some of the weakest or those who can't help themselves. Uh, there's no future without that. And that, again, may be pessimistic. And I, and, I, and I, again, I'm a proud American, but I'm incredibly disheartened by the situation we find ourselves in. Vous savez, vous savez ce qu'on dit en français mm. Sur le passé et l'avenir. Mm. Qui ne connaît pas son passé est condamné à le revivre. Mm -hmm. C'est pas Revenons... en anglais. Revenons, revenons à, à, à vos livres. Vous, vous m'avez dit que vous écriviez des livres 
avec euh, un récit, avec une histoire pour passionner alors, les militaires pour qu'ils puissent lire les dangers, parce que vous comprenez, c'est trop aride les rapports militaires, ils ne comprennent pas assez. Et, et vous écrivez des livres pour que, si j'ai bien compris, que la population civile comprenne les dangers auxquels elle, elle est exposée. Je vais essayer de citer une phrase de tête de votre co-auteur, mmh. qui est « Nous écrivons les, ces livres-là, pas pour anticiper le futur, mais pour le prévenir. Ouais. » Moi, je vais vous dire, je vais vous poser une question. Vous avez, vous avez vu le film « Idiocratie » Oh, yeah. Okay. Mike Judge. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. <rire> la question que je vous pose, c'est qui va être très dur. Ouais. Est-ce que les gens ne sont pas devenus trop cons pour comprendre à quelle sauce ils vont être mangés. This is this this aspect of education, right? Are we at a point where people don't understand what's happening, what's being done to them, right? Uh, I think it is extremely it is getting easier and easier for political leaders to take advantage of people's inattention and lack of critical thinking, right? It's not a question of innate intelligence, like like idiocracy literally supposes a decline in IQ, but We are seeing a weaponization of inattention, which, which is bizarre to say, but it is incredibly destructive if people are not able to think critically about everything from whether a new policy is being introduced to take advantage of them, but they're being told it's for their benefit. Repealing Obamacare, are one of our most successful healthcare benefits in the country that was offered in an unprecedented way to more Americans than had ever been done before. And, and it was attacked as if it was one of the most destructive things that could have been done to the country. Nothing could be further from the truth. One of the really interesting experiences during COVID, and it relates to the theme in control because we talk about basic income, the idea that in a world of less work, what are we gonna do for paying for our basic needs if not a quality of life that's meaningful? During the pandemic in the United States, I think like in France, there was incredible government support in terms of cash. People literally got cash deposited into their bank accounts. L'argent magique. Right. On avait l'argent magique aux états unis which was in effect a prototype of what our future may hold. But the conversation about that wasn't one that was forward looking. It was very much locked in the politics of the moment. And whether there's a viable way to do basic income, we have to figure that out if that's possible. But the point is the inability to think critically and observe what's happening, whether that's a fair trade-off or not, right? Is it worth the debt issuance? Is it worth the inflationary risk? All the traditional political and, and policy uh, factors. It's very hard to have those conversations at a national level. Look at how cable news is done in the US. It's about emotional response more than analytical development. Uh, I struggle to watch. I don't, I try not to. Uh, I spent Again, my whole journalistic career with the TV on next to me for 10 to 12 hours a day, uh, I've had my fill. But the point is, we're at a point where it's not useful for thinking. Even social media, I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter, which is a marvelous way to connect with people, to know things that might not have otherwise come across my transom. But too many times, the algorithm narrows my worldview rather than opens it. Too many times, my ability to concentrate and to think the kind of thoughts that I want to put into a book that feel truly novel, that feel new, that are, again, everyone's looking here, I want to look there. Social media destroys that. I, I'm so conflicted about that. And the future that we talk about in control is ultimately an expression of that, that inner feeling of really trying to understand that for every technological potential benefit, there's a cost. One of the things that we hope is that people in, the, in Silicon Valley and the technology community can use the book to better understand the consequences of these kinds of inventions that have immense market value, make people rich with stock options or whatever, but maybe the wrong thing to do for America. Euh, je sais que vous êtes attendu par des militaires français euh, juste après notre interview, donc on va prendre notre temps. <rire> on leur passe le bonjour d'ailleurs, parce que je suis sûr qu'ils sont en train de nous regarder. Euh, ils ont créé Red Team une cellule de prospective où ils font venir des auteurs de science-fiction pour leur ouvrir les chakras, mmh. leur, 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 les aider à penser en dehors de la boîte. Ouais. Votre armée fait ça depuis longtemps. Euh, la nôtre commence à se réveiller, comme d'habitude. Euh, 
Vous avez un regard critique sur ça, sur le, la maladie du sommeil de, des armées qui se réveillent toujours trop tard, qui demandent toujours beaucoup de pognon, alors que nous, on essaye de les aider. Mais est-ce que réellement, ils ont envie d'être aidés Est-ce que la prospective euh, ne les confronterait pas avec leur non-dit, leur incapacité, et est-ce que le poids de leur hiérarchie sclérosée et gangrénée ne nuit pas tout simplement aux expériences de pensée I am getting more, this is an area where I am getting more hopeful, because we're having, in the US at least, a more sophisticated conversation about how to develop, curate, and advance good ideas. Most people who work staff jobs in the U.S. military live, in, 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 live by PowerPoint, right? It is a very, very ineffective way at communicating ideas. There's some, you know, you can find online examples of some of the most complex and nonsensical charts that are out there, which in effect serve nobody. And, uh, and how many hours could be saved and better spent training? How much money could be conserved if you essentially banned PowerPoint? as a way to run a modern military like the US. A day without PowerPoint would be actually a fascinating creative prompt. But it speaks to not the problem of not having creativity in the ranks, because there are literally limitless amounts of smart people who are trying to do the Il job. Hmm? Il y en a énormément de la créativité dans les rangs militaires. Yeah, yeah. Par contre, est-ce qu'ils sont écoutés par leur hiérarchie No, but it too. And that's the problem, right? C'est ça le problème. One of the biggest concerns right now with AI and robotics is what's called innovation theater. The idea that you can throw $10 million, $20 million at, a, at, a, at an idea or a concept, a small company, and tick a box. You can make a PowerPoint presentation that says, hey, we're investing in AI. Even if there's no intention ever to deploy it at scale, especially across a force as uh, large as ours. That is a profound risk that if you perform this kind of theater without actual intent of transformation, and transforming big organizations is so hard. People who invest their careers in forming parts of innovation cells, for the most part, tend to have shorter careers. People who want to have long careers don't get as many uh, opportunities to step outside a fairly prescribed path nous, on a une expression en français pour décrire ça. Pas de couille, pas d'embrouille. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my hope, though, and this is something that you've seen, again, this is where I have that... Pour pas d'ouvert, hein, pas d'embrouille. Hein. <laughs> Look, I mean, I, like I say, I'm, I'm, I, I like to be optimistic, but I have a lot, of, a lot of pessimism in me. And this yet is one area because I'm seeing more and more senior officers, people who are on their way to become generals, even some of the recent generals we had who have been able to advocate for this kind of working and protect people in their careers to let them keep advancing, right? Because it's not often even what you're doing in your given job if you're the senior, most senior leader. It's figuring out how to protect the people who have other good ideas, who can be part of your legacy. One of the really big tests right now in the US is the reform of the United States Marine Corps. The United States Marine Corps is abandoning its commitment to tanks, the M1 tank, the F-35. This is heretical. This is a profoundly destabilizing set of policies. And it's the most correct thing I've seen in a long time. And that's a process that took time from the prior commandant, uh, commandant uh, Berger, and now, uh, excuse me, uh, Neller, and now Berger. It's posing incredible risks politically for the Marine Corps because the forces within the retired Marine Corps community are advocating against it, saying you're defanging, you're taking the, the, the claws away, so to speak. Uh, you're making the Marine Corps subordinate to the Navy even more so than it, than it already might be. It's going to make them in, unable to fight China. And yet, to me, it's one of the most successful bureaucratic transformations with the roots of a good idea. 
to fundamentally re-envision everything from the kind of rifle a Marine Corps carries to the way that small groups of soldiers on land that are from conventional forces, not forces, uh, special forces, can have a strategic impact, right? That has not been part of the traditional conversation about what to do with land forces in the US military. But now we're having that. And that's where part of that optimism comes from. Because the staff work to affect those changes, the buy-in, the convincing, the, 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 the tribal dialogue that needs to occur within those different communities, because people are giving away things that they hold dear, especially aviation. That's really hard to do. But in this notion of transformation, this notion of breaking bureaucracy to do the right thing, this is something really to watch. If it fails, if it, it's repealed, that's going to be extremely troubling and bodes very poorly for future transformations that are going to come and be required from the adoption of everything from robotic aircraft to the next generation of unmanned tanks. One, one of the, one of the biggest, one of, one of the, the biggest uh, technological trends that we're going to see is miniaturization with robotics and, in, of course, the increasing use of software in warfare. And what I think is really vexing, very difficult for the US is that in our defense industrial relationship, software does not have a zip code, meaning there is not a congressman or a lawmaker who can own a program in the same way if you build a fighter plane in my district, I'm an advocate for sustaining that program. If you build a targeting algorithm or a flight algorithm in Pittsburgh, that doesn't become part of the political establishment and is much harder to defend and see through. That's the system we have. And so I'm very mindful of that, of that transformation. Similarly, with the idea that robotics is going to allow more and more miniaturization, we're no longer going to be buying $200 million fighter jets. We're going to be buying $1 million aircraft. That has profound economic implications for big publicly traded companies that don't want that that are, are not equipped for that world. And even our, our smallest innovative companies, of which there are a growing number that want to work with the Defense Department, it's hard for them to be able to get the chance to participate because everything is so locked up. Mais ce sera surtout aussi difficile pour la population de comprendre qu'on achète des avions à 100 millions de dollars alors qu'aux états unis l'insuline pour les diabétiques coûte une fortune. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que... Non, on va poser la question différemment. Quels sont vos biais de lecture Quels sont vos... Qu'est-ce qui nuit à votre prisme de lecture est-ce que vous avez fait votre propre conduite introspective concernant vos capacités à analyser la, la situation Est-ce que, est que vous manquez de ce cynisme froid que la guerre vous apporte Est-ce que vous avez refusé de mettre un doigt de pied dans la piscine du cynisme de la guerre Ou est-ce que vous le masquez très bien Quels sont vos angles morts Concernant votre prisme de lecture, I think about uh, this this question of of needing to be able to think without thinking is really vital for analysis. To find ways to process what you've been taking in in a in a it's not a passive way, but like the way I act the way I access this is finding physical activity where I can't think about. I ride. I, I'm a big cyclist, so I'll ride a mountain bike. You're on a mountain bike, you can't think about defense policy. You're trying not to hit a tree, you're trying to you know, avoid a whatever, a log. But almost every single time that I actually make time for a ride, I have ideas that I didn't have before. And because, like I was saying with social media, we're bombarded by, by and my, my brain, I'm constantly looking, I'm looking at the sticker on your computer and thinking, is that something inspirational, right? I'm constantly sensing and seeing. I look at a cereal box and I'm, and I'm reading it, right? That's just how my brain works. So I'm constantly taking things in, and so I have to find time to process it. And you know, I'm not a writer who can sit at a desk for eight hours a day. I can write 90 minutes at a time, very intently. You know, if I write in a cafe, people look at me funny because I'm on the keyboard. 
And, and that, to me, is part of understanding how to get at good ideas. Like, where does a good idea come from? You know? and, and that's how I've come to understand. It's taken a long time to appreciate that. Because as a journalist, you're locked into a chair. You're locked into a news cycle. You have a deadline, whether it's a, a, a newspaper printing, whether it's in a financial newswire, which is real time. I've now allowed myself to work in a way, though, where the deadlines are longer. And that has given me more time to think. And that was one of the best decisions I think I made to, to create that space. Because it also allows more introspection about what am I missing, right? And, and working with a partner like, like Peter Singer is also a helpful check on that notion of where are my biases, right? What am I missing? And having someone who's smarter than you who you work with is one of the most important qualities in a teammate. Uh, being able to have an honest conversation, a trusting one, where you know, and he and I are lucky we have a friendship as much as an intellectual relationship too, which is not always the case in team writing, right? Often folks don't have that. But there's a fundamental level of trust that's reflected in how we write too. You know, when you read uh, La Flotte Fantôme, when you read Control, you can't tell who wrote which sections. Because when we write, we give the other person our section, might be a whole chapter, might be a page, and the other person has full license to destroy it. Completely. And that's a big leap. A lot of writers simply cannot do that. There's too much ego, right? There's too much investment in the words. I think one of the things, having been a journalist, having been somebody whose writing was constantly savaged and destroyed by my editors to make it better, allowed me to understand almost a notion of trust the process, right? Uh, to know that like, I actually may not have the best idea, the best way to express something. And I think that's one of the reasons why our creative partnership works so well and why the books come across, why they, why they, why they work. Il nous reste un peu de temps. On n'a pas traité le quart du dixième des questions que je voulais vous poser. Il va falloir revenir. Et je vous donne dix minutes pour aborder un sujet avec nous, euh, un sujet euh, que vous souhaitez. Vous avez envie de parler de quoi, là If we can talk about anything. I think I would probably try to understand the larger forces and themes that are at work in civil society and what are the levers that we as individuals or together we can pull to change them. What is the notion of like public will, right? And this this is a question of not just like pure dissent, but but the way that technology allows us to communicate with one another is incredibly interesting for its opportunities, right? It allows us to network, to flash mob, to whatever. But there's a darker side to that too that I think about a lot, that that can be weaponized. And this idea of whether we have a air, land, air domain, a land domain, a space domain, a sea domain, is it time for We have cyber, of course. Is it time for a sixth domain, a conversation about this notion of a human domain, a cognitive domain? This is a f one of my favorite things to think about. And it is tied very much to the question of technological advance, political decline, and the changing nature of warfare itself. That to be able to succeed militarily or strategically without ever deploying a soldier is a really fascinating aspect of conflict in the Sun 21st Zou. century. C'est Sun Tzu. Exactly. Et, et, on a um, vos trois philosophes préférés. Trois philosophes, three philosophers. For you. For me. Qui ont influencé votre vie. Mm. Alors, George Bush, ça compte pas. <laughs> I'd say William Gibson, who's a science fiction writer, right, who very much is somebody who uh, birthed the rise of what we used to call the cyberpunk movement and has moved on to other, other kind of concepts in his writing. Uh, and I would, I would consider him a philosopher, even if he is you know, in not a national academy sense. He is someone who had a very gritty and realistic way of writing that helped me when I was very young, when I read it, understand this aspect of technology that maybe it's not everything it's supposed to be, right? Uh, it's a bit like in the 1980s when I grew up, 
when you saw depictions of the future, everything was clean, right? You'd have a lot of white computers, white furniture, nothing was ever dirty. In a William Gibson novel, everything is dirty and gritty and grotty. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's really, really, really a vital aspect of how I kind of think about the future. Uh, in terms of uh, a pure political philosopher, I'm trying to better understand uh, the laws of armed conflict you know, from an ethical framework in reading historical and traditional texts, um, Thomas Aquinas, things like that. And I do that as, with a layperson's, with a, a novice perspective, having not studied that extensively. But in thinking about future conflict, it's incredibly important, I think, to look foundationally at what we establish the laws of armed conflict with. Um, for a final perspective on a philosophical source of inspiration, I'm trying to think about another writer and probably, again. Kim Kardashian? Hmm? Kim Kardashian? <laughs> Talk about cognitive warfare. She may be the five-star general of the future war. Uh, Fremont, right? Um, uh, Ray Bradbury is an American science fiction writer who, again, like William Gibson, almost takes a philosophical approach to thinking about not just the future, because not all of his stories dealt with that. He dealt with the strange, the abstract sometimes. But, but fundamentally, never losing sight of the human experience in alternate realities that we may or may not have, but that fundamentally reflect the world we're in, right? So Fahrenheit 451 is a novel. Was, I recently watched an American version of that on film uh, with Michael uh, B. Jordan, which is really good. Um, but it, so I went back and reread the novel. And, and fundamentally, what was interesting about that book was Montag, the fireman, the man whose career is to burn books, of course, has been hiding them. But his relationships with his wife is very disturbing, but very relevant for understanding the world. Secondly, his emerging mentor, who's one of the dissidents, one of the uh, librarians of sorts, right, who's really working to preserve the written word in the last moments of sort of this aspect of humanity. And that's a very powerful meditation on what it means to share knowledge, to be human together, because the world that Montag lives in is dehumanized completely. It's nothing more than neurological inputs from screens, right? The notion of reflection that the book offers that Ray Bradbury poses to the reader to understand is one of the cornerstones of, 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 of community, right? Not even just civilization, but community. Books are how we understand each other. That speaks to me. I don't think I th thought about this as profoundly when I was young. I just liked reading Dandelion Wine or Martian Chronicles or whatever. But as I spend more time writing, it's incredibly important, particularly that story. Je, je vais vous poser une question personnelle. Vous n'êtes pas obligé d'y répondre. Mm. Euh, je vois que vous avez une alliance. Votre partenaire qui doit vivre avec vous tous les jours, oui. avec un cerveau qui doit, à mon avis, phosphorer plus que la moyenne, avec un cerveau alimenté par des sources de première main, plus un instinct. Quand on voit que vous êtes ultra sportif et que vous êtes addict à, pas l'adrénaline, mais peut-être aux endorphines mmh. sécrétées durant le, le, le VTT, oui. euh, votre partenaire... Elle ou il vous gère comment C'est une personnalité qui est totalement différente de mmh. vous. Elle a développé un livre pour pouvoir gérer le cerveau d'un analyste ou il a développé un livre pour, servir, pour, euh, pour gérer le cerveau d'un analyste Comment ça se passe à la maison quand on a quatre cerveaux dans une seule boîte crânienne mmh. Yeah, my wife uh, jokes that Peter is my work wife, meaning you know, we, we spend so much time emotionally It's a good threesome. And, and, and mentally together, because even though we live in different cities, we're, we're never far from each other. It's quite funny. Um, but I think actually both of us have come to know each other better through the work. And, and actually during COVID, it was really interesting. We both came to, I think, rely on each other as friends more and more than we had even having worked on two novels. And, and that's, that's a remarkable thing. I mean, it's a profound thing. It's a personal thing. But I believe is really, really 
wonderful, right, to have that level of friendship. Intellectually, our brains are certainly different. I have a very short, I'm coming to understand my mind better the more I work, and my attention span is short. So we'll be having a conversation, especially if it's a planning conversation, and I'll want to skip to the most interesting thing, right? I want to get right into it. And it's like, nope, we have process here. And, and that is one of my big blind spots is process, right? I'm very instinctive. I see something, it intrigues me, I want to find it, pick at it, understand it, integrate it with something else. I've had to come to learn how that is a liability, right? Especially in big projects that take years. You can't do those things impulsively or instinctively. There's a, there's a logistics a process to them. And that's something because my co-writer Peter has had more experience writing nonfiction books. He's written a PhD, uh, has, a, has a wonderful process. And there's another aspect of his personality that's just wonderful and is one of my other blind spots. I'm not very good at advocacy or promotion, right? I mean, I love talking and having conversations. I could do this you know, all night long. But, but when it comes to really understanding what it means to be a writer, you have to be very savvy about how you understand the marketplace, understand how you fit into it. And that has been so helpful. And it's one of his strongest things that he brings to this relationship. Because I'm just not as good at that. I'm getting better. But I, work, I have to work on that actively. Et vous, personnellement, comment vous prenez la passivité intellectuelle des gens que ce soit vos cercles d'amis proches ou moins proches, quand vous leur faites émerger des prospectives qui sont réalistes, mais qui n'est qu qui, qui pas bonne à écouter ou à mâcher ou à ingérer. Mmh. Quand, quand vous leur annoncez, je ne vais, vais pas dire l'apocalypse, mais pratiquement, euh, de voir qu'il manque dans leurs yeux cet éclair de lucidité qu'ils qui leur permettrait de comprendre la situation. Mmh. Vous, personnellement, comment vous gérez ça mmh. I don't have a lot of friends. <rire> um, I, I, having, having worked in Washington, D.C., where everyone is extremely, in the kind of policy world, well-educated, very engaged, uh, I now live out, I live in Boston, in a, in a community that's not part of the policy world. And I actually have come to really like that because I may tell someone about what I do and they look at me like, what? Like, that's a job, right? And what that forces you to do, and I don't mean that in a, in a denigrating way, it's rather a reflection of how the wider world understands the things that many of us spend our lives trying to get better at. And that forces a lot of reflection, right? So I don't actually, get that innate, you know, antipathy when someone doesn't care about, you know, China and the threat with, of a war in the next five years. Uh, instead, I almost try to understand it more from what's important to them. Because that's mostly maybe a writer's trick, but fundamentally when you're trying to understand what's happening in the future, you know, I'm not writing books about me. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to write a book about me, right? I'm trying to write a book about real people. And, and not everybody is you know, going to be obsessed with the things I'm obsessed with. And so being able to be open at a human level, I think that's part of my optimism too, right? It's just trying to meet people where they are. Uh, and if you've driven in Boston, it's easy to hate humanity. <laughs> Maybe Paris too. Uh, and to think that we're hopeless. Uh, but to, in seriousness, to spend to time with people, to really see them where they are, is, I think, one of the best things you can actually do. On arrive à la fin de notre interview. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez donner trois livres à conseiller à notre communauté, de, trois, trois livres à, à recommander à notre communauté Alors, vous n'avez pas le droit de donner les vôtres. Trois livres qui yeah. ont influencé votre vie. Alors, ça peut être des livres de géopolitique, comme ça peut être des contes pour enfants, ou ce que vous voulez. Mm. Trois livres. Uh, I would say, if you want to, to read a book about America that is, I think, one of the most interesting, it's actually a trilogy uh, by Don Winslow, uh, which is, uh, starts, I'm uh, blanking on the name, it just finished with the final book called The Border. Um, it's about, essentially, the rise of the narco economy in Mexico and the U.S., and following it through a very 
specific and unique character who is essentially a DEA agent. Uh, it is one of the most important pieces of American fiction. Again, it's three novels, it's maybe 1,200 pages or more altogether. Uh, most recently, The Border. The Power of the Dog is the first one. The, car the Cartel is the second one. And the third is The Border. It deals with everything from the drug industry to political corruption in the White House. It is a true saga, okay? Yeah. Est-ce que ça parle des opérations spéciales des services américains pour importer de la drogue pour pouvoir financer des opérations spéciales ou pas du tout? Pas de contre. Non, non, it does, it does. It deals. Ah, il en yeah, parle yeah, quand yeah, même. Yeah, yeah, ah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it looks at at not just that, but everything from private military contractors doing counter. I mean, it's it's a complete story, and his ability to research. And he, I think he's written at this point 15 or 16 novels, so he's he's a master. Um, so so I would read The Power of the Dog, Cartel. I would read uh, The Border. Uh, I would go back to William Gibson, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, I would recommend everybody read his older books, but he has a more recent novel called The Peripheral, which is set in America. Again, it describes a future, very dystopian America in which uh, there's more automation, sure, but it deals with a really interesting set of problems that in part come from the invention of what is called quantum tunneling, the ability to communicate between different realities. And that sounds like science fiction, but it's more than that. And it's very much a story about the future of America, particularly politics and power, which I highly recommend. Uh, and uh, he has a sequel to that as well called Agency. Um, the third book, I might say, uh, that was influential for me from, I mean, I, I read all the time. But when I was very young, and I'll go back to what we talked about earlier with the, one of the first, the second Tom Clancy book, Red Storm Rising. It's not high literature, but I read that book at 12 years old. And what's interesting is, so did my co-writer Peter Singer. We both had the same experience of really for the first time picking a book up and not moving until you finished it, right? And that was the kind of kid I was, like I would do that. Uh, and when we wrote La Flotte Fantôme, going back to rereading that book for inspiration, which we very much did, was a really kind of alpha omega moment of going back to, you know, I sometimes joke that what I do now is not much different than what I thought I should be doing at 15 or 16 years old, right? You know, reading and writing, you know, fiction and, 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 and things like that. Um, but those, those books are all quite different. But for each, Don Winslow is the kind of writer I aspire to be. Same with William Gibson, who I think can really tackle these, these complex subjects beautifully. And then, you know, Clancy for just being the first seed that was planted. Est-ce que vous avez vu ce film, si mes souvenirs sont bons, ça doit être Newsroom. Est-ce que vous avez vu quand euh, un journaliste, euh, on lui pose la question, l'auditoire lui pose la question, pourquoi l'Amérique est le plus beau pays du monde hmm. Vous avez vu ce film-là C'est un film ou un TV show C'est un film. Non, je ne me souviens pas. Alors moi, je vais vous poser la question yeah. différemment. Pourquoi l'Amérique n'est pas le plus n'est plus le plus beau pays du monde. Mm. Why is America the most beautiful country in the world? Was is not anymore. Why is it not? Oh, um, I think like I was saying, our inability to take care of one another. I mean, if I could reduce it to a human level, no policy, no politics, we stop taking care of one another. That's not religion. That's not that's not doctrine. That's just at a human level. That's been, our divisions are being exploited every single day for economic gain, for political gain. And it's hurt our ability to take care of each other. That sounds almost like a Christian Episcopalian message, but, but we, we need to do that better. And if, and if you were to think about resiliency, if you were to think about our future as a place where people want to live and have children, I would, I would fix that. La dernière question, c'est pas une question. C'est laisser une bouteille à la mer. Mm. Uh, quelque chose d'impérissable, un conseil pour les jeunes générations. Hmm. I wish I had some really uh, concise aphorism. I think about this a lot with my, my, my daughters. Um, I think I would go back to what I just said, take care of other people. When you're ever faced with a hard decision, are you taking care of somebody else? I, I When you think about the decisions we make in our lives, we have to live with them. They come to us in the night. They invade our minds during the day. 
it's important to be able to make decisions, even when we have to make bad ones, because sometimes we do. We have to live with them. And I think if you can revert to a principle like that, and again, I know this sounds uh, corny, as you'd say in English, but, it, but I think it's a fundamental human quality that, that, that we can't be afraid of, especially when so many, again, so many people are trying to pull us apart or get us to fight one another. I think I would put in that bottle, take care of other people. If I, if I think about how I raised my daughters, I want them to be adventurous, take risks physically, emotionally, intellectually, but to know how to take care of other people. And that's hard to teach. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. Auguste Kuhl, merci. C'est moi qui je vous remercie beaucoup.